Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest CTO Craft Bytes. Uh, today, we're looking at the importance of executive presence and uh, how you can use that to influence. Uh, if this is your first time in a CTO Craft Bytes, let me tell you a little bit more about the CTO Craft community. Uh, it's a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing and supporting technologists on their personal and uh, business growth, uh, professional growth. Uh, overall, now we've got over 5,000 members. That's grown very quickly recently. And uh, CTO Craft provides one-to-one -one coaching, mentoring groups. There's also a curated Slack community uh, and events like this one. So if you're not a member, then please do join us. Uh, so special thanks today to our uh, headline partner, AWS, for helping make these uh, Bytes events possible. So today I'm I'm joined by Phil Reynolds from Workday. Uh, Phil, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Dan, and, and hello to everyone out there. Um, so yeah, Phil Reynolds, I, I work at a, a software company called Workday. Um, we sell HR and finance software. Um, I've been there for close, just over 11 years. So joined a couple of years before we went public. Um, I'm actually based in our, our Dublin, Ireland office. So we're, we're a kind of California headquartered company. And I guess I've been on this kind of crazy um, kind of rocket ship growth, I guess, with the company over the last kind of 11 years or so. So I'm a VP of engineering. I run a bunch of our kind of infrastructure and public cloud uh, work essentially at Workday. Great. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for joining us today. So I'm Dan Smith. Um, I'm a, a coach, a coach technology leaders uh, through my own company and also through CTO Craft. Uh, help with some other things like the mentoring circles. So I think there's a button down there about those if you'd like to learn more that, about that. Uh, also work as a, a, a fractional interim CTO. Um, so this is a topic I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, Phil, kick us off. Tell us what for you is executive presence? What does it mean? Yeah, and, and this is probably the hardest question, I think, of, of the actual day. I think if you ask different people, you'd, you'd probably get different answers. And it, it can be really hard sometimes to define it. I think it's, it is one of those things where it's nearly easier to see it and observe it. And a bit like an elephant, it's like you kind of know it when you see it. And, it's, and it can be hard to describe how to construct it. But um, for me, it's, it's hugely focused around... Um, I guess the gravitas, the kind of being able to um, kind of command essentially kind of a presence in a room and then, and then ultimately to a point at which you need to be able to influence. And I think we probably have a lot of maybe stereotypes in our head what executive presence looks like. Um, but at the, I suppose it's really about how you make other people feel in certain situations and, and ultimately about building credibility and trust with um, you know, the various different parts of the business that, that you interact with, particularly as a senior leader. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask you this next question, Phil, but I also want people in the audience to type their answers into the chat. So why is this topic so important to you? And, you know, what do you, I mean, for the audience, what are they interested in learning? But what is it that, that really interests you? Yeah, I think for me, this was, it, it's a very personal journey to some degree. You know, we spoke about this a little bit, I guess, is I'm, I'm not sure I'm necessarily the most foremost expert in the world on executive presence. And, and um, I think in the early stages of my career, I nearly resisted against the, the notion that this was something that I needed to develop in and be more intentional about. Um, and so it's, that's actually been quite a personal journey for me over those 11 years of workday as I've seen, you know, the, an area that I needed to develop in. And so for me, what's interesting about it, I guess, is just maybe talking about my own story in the context of that, uh, hearing about it from others, and, and, and hopefully maybe bringing a level of awareness to a topic that, that I think is critically important for any senior leader in, in, a, in a business. Okay, great, thanks, Phil. So I hope everyone's listening to us because no one's told us why they're interested. And we've got over 50 people here, so. I'm looking forward to hear from, from them. Um, also, you've got the chat on the right, and then down the bottom, you've got ask a question. Uh, so if you click on that, you can ask a question, and I will pick as many of those as I can uh, and uh, ask Phil, and of course, I'll, I'll join him with my, my point of view. So, so please do get your questions in there because we want to, to give you what you've come for. Um, so where should we start, Phil? I mean, maybe, how how can you use executive presence? How can you build it? And, and you know, how can you use it to influence people? Who might you look to influence? 
Yeah, I, I kind of think, I suppose, in, with any kind of senior leader in a business, um, you know, you're, you're kind of wearing three hats. And, and people talk about this in different ways. But I think, A, you, you lead your own organization. And in, in some ways, you know, a lot of us get these jobs by the ability to do that, if that makes sense. You know, so we're mm -hmm. technically credible. We're often speaking a language that's native to us in terms of the language of technology and engineering or, or whatever it might be. Um, the second hat, I think, is to run the business hat. I mean, if you're an executive in a business, you are you are running the business. Um, there's typically a board of directors. You have a CEO and you've got peers. Um, and, and so that is, to me, is a different hat. And I think the third one is really a teammate um, for whatever team that you're on. So if you're on the executive team, you've got teammates who are in HR, in marketing, in finance, who need your help and support. And likewise, um, you know, you need theirs, essentially. And so, you know, in terms of influence, I would say executive presence um, and maybe my own personal experience from, from what I've seen, if you like leading your organization, it's not that that isn't important, but it, it often maybe comes a little bit more natural because I think a lot of us have um, maybe immediate credibility within the world that we know really well. But the run the business and being a teammate hats, I think, are, are where uh, I have personally and I've seen other people um, put less, less emphasis on. And so how do you have enough credibility in those arenas how do you show up well enough with people who don't see you every day and don't come from the world that you grew up in, if that was kind of the technology world, um, mm -hmm. such that you can influence the business in the right way? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'll mention that maybe the influence word has been interesting because I think, and, and uh, for me, you know, there was a, that was maybe a little bit of a dirty word in the earlier stages of my career. Like there was maybe a little bit of uh, salesmanship attached to that and I think I've got much more comfortable over my career really understanding you know whether influence is good or bad is really about the intent um, and I think mm -hmm. your your mindset your approach and your intent as you try and drive you know the agenda for your organization when you're wearing that hat for the business when you're wearing that hat and then for your peers and teammates when you're wearing that hat um, is, is actually critically important and so you know you're a, with, with good intent if you like um, you know, influence, I think, is, is a tool to be developed and, and wielded, um, you know, within, within the context of a business. And ultimately, a business is a collaboration of people at the end of the day. And so being able to work together is a critical component to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it, about influencing and sort of influence, influencing for good or sort of the more negative influencing, which could be perceived as manipulation so I guess there's not always a, a, a clear line between the two because something you might feel for good can leave other people feel threatened so um, I guess that's something people I've just noticed there's someone asking a question about um, common executive presence mistakes and I'm sort of thinking okay yeah appearing manipulative would be a, a big mistake because you've kind of lost your credibility um so you, you with with great power comes responsibility so if you consider that your executive presence is a, a power you've built up it can easily lose it by sort of doing something rash or um you know over overtly manipulating but then there's also this kind of more subtle like okay well i'm doing this because i believe it's good for my team but without sort of really realizing there's other impacts yeah, I, I you touched on one point there around, I mean, you know, kind of cliche of a kind of trust is easy, you know, it's kind of hard won but easily lost. And I think um, for me, um, everyone shows up. I think the cliche around maybe someone with executive presence is this very kind of calm, composed. I, I had an old boss that used to call it kind of the 40 long, basically, like, you know, this, you know, very seasoned kind of executive leader who, um, you know, it's just completely cool under pressure. And, you know, they've seen everything, they've been there and they've done it all. And, mm -hmm. and while maybe that's where, you know, some of us may end up in another 15 or 20 years, a lot of us haven't seen it all and, 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 and aren't always as composed and calm as, as we need to be. Um, I think composure and calmness is a quality that you want to try and develop in situations. But maybe just to get back to your point around th that trust and credibility, I think authenticity here is 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 really important, and so empathy for 
Um, I think we, we often have natural empathy for our teams. You know, we were, we were the engineers, maybe we were the managers that, you know, that we now lead. And so I think, again, organically, I think we often have empathy for our own organizations. My experience is, is that can be harder to develop with your peer organizations and potentially with the CEO and the board as they look to uh, run the business, think about capital allocation, finances, people, marketing. Um, and I, I think... If you can, if you can be authentic and seek to understand the other areas of the business, and give it, bear in mind one of the hats that I talk about is the run the business hat. Um, I've made it my business over the years to understand more about finance, to understand more about uh, HR organizational psychology. I, I'm not a HR expert. I'm not a finance expert. I couldn't do my peers' jobs, um, but I, I certainly know an awful lot more about the constraints that they're under. Um, the, the 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 demands, if you like, of their role. And then over time, I think I've been able to show up much more authentically as a partner to those organizations. If you had asked me what HR was 10, 15 years ago, I think I probably would have given you a very trite response about what their function was in the business. And, and I, I think about that completely differently now. And that comes from a very authentic place, but it also comes from um a, a place i suppose i needed to put some effort and energy into and so that empathy for me was a, a really key unlock of who are these individuals what are they trying to do i work thankfully in an organization where i think everyone is just trying to do a good job and so I, I'm, I'm authentic about that and giving people the benefit of the doubt um and therefore when you know when i speak hopefully talk i can talk a little bit of their language and hopefully understand what they're trying to optimize for and then look for ways that we can create kind of a, a win-win scenario. How can I do right by my organization and still try and meet the demands that our peer organizations or a board or um, you know, or the CEO uh, or, or some other part of the business kind of requires? Mm -hmm. Okay. So great points there about um, composure and, and gravitas. So I know certainly one thing I've noticed with people I would say have executive presence is that they have this kind of slightly measured approach so they, they'll pause a little bit to consider which is something I think we could all learn to do um, so if someone asks you a difficult question or puts you in a tight spot actually thinking about it um, and and considering the response is something people will accept as a as a benefit whereas it's quite often people sort of think, oh, I've got to ask this quickly and, and rush in. So, but the, the other side of that is that people that have this kind of presence, they're decisive and they, when they do respond, it's somehow kind of thoughtful yet decisive. Uh, so there, there's an interesting sort of, I guess, balance between like pausing, but then acting, but not, you know, not pausing for so long and dithering like, uh, well, certain people in, in power in, in this country. Um, but anyway, so that was one thing that, that, that came up for me there. Um, and also admitting that you're wrong, right? I mean, people sometimes think, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a top executive, I get everything right. Well, that's not, not true, right? Everyone makes mistakes. And admitting when you're wrong, showing some humility, I think is also another important part. Um, so uh, let's have a look here. We got this. Uh, it looks like people can vote on the questions, which is good. So we've got three votes on this one about common executive presence mistakes. What other ones can you think of, Phil, that you could share? Yeah, if I could maybe elaborate on the last point you made there, which is you know executive presence is we in Workday we've kind of got a bit of a decision making framework, and it's always trying to own the D, if you like. You know this this idea of owning the decision. You know the the, the fist pounding kind of you know uh, maybe cliche executive. You know, everyone go this way, and and I think that's certainly one stereotype. Um, you know that we have in our mind, and and to your point, you know the best leaders, you know, know when to lead with humility, know when to lead with authenticity, know that leadership comes from a place of, of vulnerability a lot of the time, um, and you know, and, and I guess have the confidence to lean into those things. You know, I, I often think the fist pounding comes from a place of insecurity, right? The place of security, to your point, is the measured, calm response. Um, and it, it can be hard, you know, like if we were to sit here for 30 seconds and not say anything and look into the screen, that's actually a very awkward moment for most people, right? To sit 
in quietness. And so the people who are able to do that are typically leaning into um, a lot of confidence in their own ability, I think, to control a room and, and kind of manage a room and manage people and to come up with a thoughtful and measured response. And um, I think that's certainly one, maybe one that's maybe more relevant. And I'll talk about my own personal journey, but I've seen it in others as well as the idea that, um, you know, I think in, in particular people coming from a technology background, the idea that everything is a meritocracy. Um, and so that if I just have the best idea, the best idea is what should get done regardless of how I present that idea, regardless of how much empathy I've taken into account from my peers, regardless of the support or biases of the people in the room, right? Clearly this is the best idea and therefore clearly this is why, you know, what we should do next. And I think um, the more I've understood other areas of the business, the larger the trust that's built up between myself and those individuals and, whether we like it or not, if you like, I would love if everything was a meritocracy in some ways, even still to this day. But my trust relationships with the people in the room when a decision needs to be made heavily influences essentially whether they side with the idea that's coming out of my mouth or not. And, and over time, I've really just accepted that that is human nature. There, there's very little that you know you can do to change how other people are going to show up and um and decide and so those are maybe kind of two areas i think are, are are really important um and that can be big downfalls and i'll again maybe i'll talk personally have been a real mind shift change for me if you like over my my career journey mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah when, when we talked before you shared a little bit about um earlier on how you maybe didn't value executive presence in others or you you had some sort of doubts about its uh how genuine it was um which we 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 discussed so it might be useful to come back on that but i'm interested to that we give as, as many kind of tips to to people as well on how they can go on that journey and i mean like you i'm you know still on the journey i i think it's probably everyone will still be on the journey but had a little yeah. bit more time and a few more years to practice it. Um, so let, let's share some tips. I, I just noticed an interesting um, piece of feedback here from Zachary that he says um, that he noticed that people often with executive presence often ask questions, at least seemingly with genuine curiosity rather than giving directives. So this interest in people, um, which is, is, I think, a great, a great thing to notice. And I, I, I think I would agree with that um so maybe i mean i imagine we've got people at different stages in their career but going back to this idea of it being a journey to build executive presence how how do people get started you know make sure that they keep on the train make sure they keep moving how long might it take yeah i i it's definitely a journey and not an event um from certainly from where i sit i think you alluded to some outputs of that journey is that I think your confidence does build over time. And so if you think about, you know, maybe the word gravitas that we use, I think gravitas is an outcome, but it's not, I don't think it's something where I can say, Hey Dan, I think you need more gravitas. And that's like an actionable thing that, mm -hmm. that you can have. Right. And um, I think there are people who will come with a natural level of confidence. Sometimes that's overconfidence. And so confidence isn't necessarily, um, and me, you know, the, the complete end all and be all. And so for, for me, the journey started with awareness, I guess. So first of all, an awareness of this topic, which is how I'm perceived is heavily influences, if you like, my ability to drive my organization's agenda uh, and to drive the business forward in a, in a certain way. Um, and, you know, in the early stages of my career, if, if I had driven the business forward in certain ways, I would have been driving the business forward in the wrong ways because I wasn't actually taking into consideration the other areas around me. And so um, for me, the journey started with a level of awareness like, hey, I'm struggling at times to influence the business for what I really think is the right thing to do. And that journey progressed on to actually maybe some of those things are not the right thing to do for the business even though i thought they would have been because i lacked the empathy and the understanding of what the other areas needed to do um and if you like so we it was nearly like we kind of met both ways as i started to build you know high trust relationships and connections with people and really understood that i needed to make an investment and and be better at 
these one-to-one -one connections with my peers or with the, the, the various stakeholders that we talked about earlier on, those high trust connections for me started to lead to better outcomes when we got into a room and mm -hmm. it, you know from 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 my own personal agenda and what better outcomes didn't necessarily mean that i just got my way i actually felt like we got a better outcome i understood the outcome when maybe it didn't go my way as okay look actually in this particular case we didn't consider hr or the finance repercussions of what we were doing and now i can really understand why when we were caught between these two decisions, we kind of had to make a left turn instead of the right turn that I was suggesting when I looked at it from my boat. And that was an aha moment for me, I think. A, observing how other people did it, and I think it was probably the beneficiary of seeing that around me, and then suddenly experiencing it maybe for the first time. And so I think a huge amount of this journey is 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 this constant cycle of reflection. And for anyone who's done any executive coaching or, or is thinking about it, I think executive coaching is a really strong forcing function to force you into that reflection cycle of, you know, do, adjust, observe, and then actually reflect basically kind of back in and say, you know, how am I showing up now? And that's the reason why it's a journey is because even when we know, if you like some of the things that we need to correct, I think as people, habits are the hardest things to break. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, the, the way to, that I broke the, them enough over time, I think, was really being authentic about understanding more about the business, more about my peers, how they they needed to show up, what they what they were optimizing for, being authentic with the relationships that I had, using them to understand more about their areas, and then being able to show up like a business leader in the right conversations, such that I was trying to optimize for the right outcome as opposed to my outcome. And I, I don't know if that resonates, but that, that, you know, that was my, if you like, kind of journey, journey through that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm reflecting back that when I was a, a young whippersnapper a long time ago and my, my first jobs and I was, I probably saw the, the executives, I probably didn't even know what executive presence was, but, you know, wondered why they spent all day talking and seemed to be important. And I did the hard work actually doing things. Um, and of course, I've learned since then that actually speaking can have real outcomes. I mean, anyone that's been sent to jail will probably understand when they've been sentenced, literally the sentence is sending them to jail, right? So there's there's something in words that's important in itself. But also that um, the, the kind of decisions that are, are being made by executives really direct the kind of work the, the worker ants like I was what they're doing so giving that kind of context as you say um, but then now the other sort of side where I think that I'm getting to some level of executive presence then I still and sometimes have to work quite hard but I still need to retain this empathy with people that are beginning their careers that haven't got this understanding and it's you know quite easy for me to when I think okay when I was like that yes I was in this situation so there might be some kind of disconnect so i would say that's another mistake that people can kind of they grow and lose track of, of where they came from so that they can't relate to people um so yeah if, if we're still on the i think if we'll, we'll probably still highlight some more mistakes as we go but that would be one for me um so andrew uh, posted a question Quite near the beginning so let, let's have a look at that one so how best to frame technology improvements in a way that the board can understand and get behind so that's an interesting one isn't it because it's as a technology executive how we present things is well quite often hard to understand uh, or misinterpreted so what tips have you got there phil yeah, I think I think the kind of cliche here is how, how do you convince people to invest in technical debt, right? Like you know, and that that can often be a struggle with your with your peers, with the, with the CEO, with um, you know, with with the with the with the board. I imagine absolutely. Um, you know, I think I think the first thing to understand is you know you know when you guess when you're in a situation where you're trying to um, push for certain things to happen and certain improvements. Um, is what is the CEO's job and what is the board's job? And and I would boil it down in this circumstance, if you're in a room talking about the areas that you need to invest in, a hiring plan or something like that, I mean, it's capital allocation, right? So 
Um, and to some degree, that capital allocation function is saying, well, we've got X amount of dollars in the business and we have to decide where we're going to put that to move the needle. Um, and, you know, for most businesses, growth is a first class objective, right? And, and while everyone may be on different growth trajectories, typically speaking, if, if you're in a business with a board, um, you know, growth is going to be, is, is what they're looking for. And so um, my experience of, boards is obviously there's a wide variety of skill sets there it's extremely useful obviously if you have someone from, from a technology background on a board who you don't have to convince what technical debt is and so if you can you know find some of those people and build the relationship with that board member i think that's a really useful thing and um different companies view that differently in my experience about kind of board into senior management relationships so I, i'm going to talk in a lot of generalities here and everyone's situation will be specific but maybe just to talk, use those generalities, you need to link the investments that you want to make in each of the different areas that you want to make, whether that be technical debt or it might be, you know, I guess maybe kind of softer and more intangible investments that they have to make, maybe if it's around kind of leadership training or whatever it might be, with the lens of how is this going to help the business grow and why is this the right place to put, put capital now? And... Um, my experience that over time is just is to try and balance it is you can't you can't ask for that and not make sure that you're balancing the investment that you have with a growth plan basically as well right and in, in most product and most technology businesses and not not everyone here might be working in a quote-unquote technology business maybe you're in a technology role um but you know product and engineers are the biggest constraint of the business in any technology business. And so, you know, you need to be mindful of that is like as the, the ability for the business to grow is very much dependent on your ability to produce product. And I think if you can show up with empathy, with, which is how do we, you know, improve the velocity and trajectory here and, and make sure people feel like you're on board with that and that you're not constantly in this tug of war with the rest of the business or with the board around, well, you're going too fast over here and we've got to figure this out over here. And and what you want to be seen as on the other side is, is essentially balanced, which is accounting and acknowledging the growth that has to happen at the top end of the business, which will be directly re related to the products and features that you're going to produce and using that as credibility and hopefully maybe with some support from some knowledgeable people to justify the investment in the in the in the technology investments that you need to make, which are a long term investment, and so I think if you can focus the investors, the board members, the CEO on long term, which is just a delicate balance between just hitting the next quarter, hitting the next year's numbers, but what happens when you want to go for your next round of funding? We're going to be back in the same position again, and my team is going to be going slower. So you have to link that short term versus long term, long term technical investments versus everything else. The larger your growth rate as a business, in my experience, the harder it is to try and keep up with tech debt. And that, that is a very, very difficult thing to be in the middle of for anyone who's a pure technologist who understands the ramifications of some of the short-term decisions you're going to make. Um, sometimes maybe the best advice I can give is you're going to have to get comfortable being uncomfortable with some of the decisions that have to be made in terms of what the top-line growth of the business is based on your on your year-on-year -year kind of growth percentage and the trajectory that you're on, if you like, as well, mm -hmm. which maybe isn't the answer everyone wants to hear either mm. yeah it's interesting I, i'm just looking at the the words there the to frame technology improvement so the first thing that comes to my mind is are uh, i mean do you even frame it as a technology improvement if it's if your company is a, a pure tech company then okay maybe but most ceo and board members really aren't that interested in the technology i mean Mm. this audience we're all technologists so we love tech but actually what i tell my clients is if, if you're in a board meeting and you're talking about tech then it's time to be quiet unless someone specifically asked you to explain it because generally people aren't interested in the technology they're interested in the implications and as you say the implications for growth uh, efficiency usually uh, or i mean gaining market share or, or actual revenue growth so really in in the context of the board meetings you need to keep your discussions and your you know your in, uh, improvements or your um, what's the word uh, initiatives i maybe might say should be aligned to some kind of business objective 
Um, and I, I saw at the top there, it's, uh, Trevor said, why are we still talking about IT in the business? So have a, have a look at his comment. But I think quite, and he quite um, rightly says that, uh, yeah, I think he says it in exactly, but business, it, IT is often seen as a cost rather than a, an enabler for business. So if, if your initiatives that you're presenting to, to the board are driving the business, then yeah, then you're really part of it. There's this kind of separation disappears. Um, and again, having this kind of uh, executive presence, then you you show up as the credible person, whether you're, you know, IT department, HR, finance. Um, though I, I had another point there, but it's gone. Anyway, so... If you, out of down, out of curiosity, if, what, what would you say is the common language in board meetings, if you like? I don't know if that question is slightly opaque. I suppose I have an answer in my head, but uh, what's the common language you need to speak, if you like? You've got to speak three different languages in these in these roles. What's the language of the boardroom? Well, for me, the language of the boardroom is about the business objectives, so the direction of the business. Um, so really the the individual things in your department you might be bringing the kind of the headlines but the details you would be managing mainly in your department right so what goes on under the surface um you would be managing in your department but if you think about what other people bring like the finance department will bring the kind of the overall numbers they won't bring all the details right because i mean Who's interested in that? Just the finance department, and the same with HR. You know, they'll they'll bring the key metrics, but they won't be bringing all their policies and so on. So, I think thinking of it in that way is is you know important to to think. Okay, well, is this really interesting to my or interesting to my audience or relevant to my audience? So, what what was what was you thinking when you when you asked the question? Yeah, I think I always kind of think about incentives, if you like, and I think it's a really powerful way to think. And and to me, I guess the if you think about what a board's composed of, it, it's typically, you know, you know, nominated people from institutional shareholders, right? You know, essentially it's 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 very linked to the capital structure of the business and the shareholder structure of the business in most in most most areas I've seen. Um, and while there might be governance functions with independent members, et cetera, there, uh, in reality they're doing the job on behalf of the shareholders. And what are shareholders doing? They're giving you X dollars and asking for Y dollars in return. And so just remember that's always the common, that is the common language of the board, I think, is that they're, you know, the shareholders are giving the business X dollars, the board are governing that and expecting Y dollars in return. And I think if you can always bring your conversations back down to that very simple equation of, well, you're giving me X dollars and this is how I give you Y dollars in some sort of future time frame, um, you know, and, and so really I think, yeah, getting getting more comfortable, if you like, with, with framing things exactly like you said it, I think, getting closer to the business, getting closer to... Um, you know, and away from technology, unless it pertains to product and strategy, and you're in that conversation piece, if you like. But mm -hmm. from a justification of investment, it's it's capital allocation. It's I give you X, you give me Y. How are you going to give me more Y based on whatever you're planning to invest that in over the next few years? And that's definitely was a big sea change for me personally going through it, and. As someone who does a small bit of angel investing in the side and, and helps kind of some startup founders um, who generally come from a technical background, I think it's something that you know you can get more comfortable with over time. There's no there's no magic to this. You don't have to be a fully trained accountant, um, but you do need to show up and think about there's money coming in, there's money expected to come back out. How is what I'm doing helping that goal? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah, so much, so many good points there, Phil um i'll let those sink in and I, I just remembered the 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 last point that i that came up for me was about um sometimes my clients come to me and say okay well i'm i'm trying to sell this idea to my my board and my ceo but it involves spending money it's usually a technical debt thing right um and they don't want to spend money so for me, there's a couple of ways around that. It's like, okay, well, you've got to show the whole life cycle, right? Yeah, we're spending 100000 now, but we'll get it back within something. People like the actual numbers, right? Uh, if you can say in 18 months or a certain amount of money, that's, that's always a good point. 
And then the other one is about saying, okay, well, you remember when we added this feature last, I don't know, last quarter and it took us six weeks. Well, look, we do this and we can do these kind of changes in a week. And yeah. so these kind of changing people's view, you see, you're not, to do that, you're not talking about the technology. Well, we have to do it because this version's going out of support and blah, blah, blah. No one cares about that. Okay, well, the, there might be a business risk uh, because of security, but actually what people want to know is generally how efficient can they be and how quickly can they do things. So the, those were a, a couple of tips I wanted to, to share there. Um, let's, let's move on. I'm sure we could spend all day on there. There's another interesting question from Chris here. How do you influence stakeholders that are resistant to change or have strong conflicting opinions? tricky one for you yeah i i mean i mean that that is hard but if you're if you're in you know um i i, I still come back down to there's, there's very little my experience of this is sometimes is that if you have people that start out on polls and your job is to try and influence both of those stakeholders to kind of a common path in between you're nearly now not trying to influence it's not the same, I think, as a one-to-one -one influence situation. I nearly think you become a mediator, which is that your job is to actually get those two people to kind of compromise in some way about some some way through the middle. And that's not always the case, but um, it, it requires a significant amount of time and investment. It requires, you know, it, it, everything is easier when trust is involved. The higher trust relationship you have with each of those individuals, the more um, likely it is that they can understand where you're coming from you can understand where they're coming from and that you can find negotiable middle ground places that are safe to converse in and play in and make a decision in, if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, I, I, I've gotten to the stage now where I, I nearly know by the tone of voice or I know by body language, like, do I need to actually, you know, do I need to get into a one-on-one -on -one conversation here and kind of put a little bit more investment in the one-on-one -on -one relationship? Um, you know, th this does take time and energy. And, and I've seen maybe, maybe the best practical tip I can give here is if you're trying to make decisions in rooms, um, I don't know, boss, tell me once, basically decision ar decisions aren't made in groups of people, right? The decisions often made before the group gets into the room, all the hard work or, or no work in some cases has been done before you come in. And so you're, you rarely influence a group or even two people, quite frankly, by sitting in a meeting room and, and talking about it. And I'm sure it can happen, but I I really lean into the power of one to one relationships there and understanding it. And it's it's why politicians can whip votes and understand where people are going to place their bets when it comes to voting in. It is um, you know you, you kind of understand where people are going to land nearly. So if you can't even see where someone is probably going to take a perspective, it probably suggests that you need to invest a little bit more time. And if you've got two people on the polls, I would look for a way that you can manage them individually to try and come together. And if, 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 if they're in your way, if you like, if you need them to agree to move forward, then your job probably turns into a little bit of mediation such that you can kind of progress on to the next step. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if that's helpful, but it's what comes to mind. Yeah, so resistance for change is, it, resistance to change is an interesting topic in itself. Um, and that can be for a number of reasons. I mean, one of them is fear. Um, you know, I'm okay as I am, but I, uh, I'm going to keep to my boundaries. Um, and another one is lack of perspective. Um, so a lot of the coaching work I do is working on this kind of edge where people sort of realize they want to change, aren't sure how to, don't know how to. Um, so usual way into this is through awareness so often stakeholders have a, a completely different picture or an incomplete picture of what's going on and i mean if i'm a stakeholder i have exactly the same right there's always things i don't know but having these kind of discussions that raising awareness so asking these kind of genuine curiosity questions that uh, sorry i can't remember who mentioned but working out so you know what is the implication of this for you okay we're not saying we're doing it but if we do and then coming going backwards and forwards um this can often uncover alternatives which maybe don't conflict or less conflict um 
and also help people understand you know well we, reason we're doing this is that you know it has this impact if we don't or it has this opportunity if we do and people often don't really see that they just see something quite short-sighted oh you know they're going to hire or fire all these people and that means that my job's at risk well actually it might not it might be you know opening up whole new possibilities so for me raising the awareness of, of everyone who is a stakeholder and then you can have a kind of more if you like more adult conversation about it rather than these sort of fears and um sort of more petulant responses so that that would be my kind of uh, advice there I think, okay, so, I think you touched on one yeah, really on. interesting point there dan mm -hmm. if you're if you're okay with me. I, I, i've i've talked about this with some of my leaders which is this idea of a safe conversation versus an unsafe one and, and it's probably not the greatest metaphor in the world but um and that i think unsafe is a very loaded term but when you're in a group a group of people and you disagree with someone in most normal situations that's got people a little bit on edge right if i if we're here and there's a you know however many people listening to us and i take umbrage of whatever you say and I, I would agree that 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 is a very productive way for a business to run in a lot of ways that we can challenge each other ideas you have to be careful about how you challenge them and i think in a lot of ways you know pushing that conversation to a safer place without so much of the pressure is one technique i've seen used very very well to to kind of help induce a little bit of a change mindset if that makes sense mm -hmm. and to help kind of understand you know really pick it apart a little bit and that it's kind of a controlled explosion right from their perspective if they're a little bit change averse they're like well this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation nothing can kind of happen from here i'm not going to agree to anything and your job is not to get them to agree to anything in that in that conversation either right there's no decision being made but it is about understanding, seeking to understand, informing, educating in a really genuinely authentic way. I think that's a really, really powerful tool that is takes away the pressure cooker impact of a group and a decision and maybe the decision being lost with like, you know, the people. And if I disagree with your decision, am I, do I think you're a terrible person and all of the dynamics that can go with that and doing that in front of your boss, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so... Um, one heuristic I, I think of it is that kind of safe versus unsafe is like moving this exactly the same conversation. It could be maybe exactly the same content from a safe space to an unsafe space or vice versa can change the dynamic, can change the response and therefore help you influence a little bit more as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also there are techniques, I mean, I'm, comes to mind De Bono's six thinking hats where you can make conversations more safe by breaking up the time into certain sort of categories of thinking in that case so that might be one that uh, people might want to, to look up I'll, I'll type it in the in the chat in a minute. um we've got a couple more questions so let, let's go ahead and, and answer those so uh one from salman here uh in the context of executive present what Presidents, what advice do you have for a senior leader who has joined a new company or organization? Yeah, um, listen a lot at the start. Um, you know, I think every organization, and, and I've moved between organizations even in Workday, has a different, slightly different adjusted culture. And I, I think there's a lot of unspoken norms, conventions, and everything else. And I think you'll do well to listen more than talk, certainly through your first, you know, 30 days, basically. Um, I, I tend to work a 30, 60, 90 plan. And so I think as you come into a new organization, when I talked about the three hats earlier on of, you know, leading your organization, running the business, and being a teammate, as a new leader in an organization, you leading your org is not a given necessarily you have to earn that right as well as you have to earn the other hats as opposed to maybe when you grew up in an organization you've often hired a lot of the people the managers and to some degree more often than not if you're still there you're doing something right if you like um coming in you kind of have something to prove you have something to prove to your team um and i think there's a lot of listening involved you know to do that and i know that's not necessarily like 
um, maybe the answer that's going to direct you towards how do I show up as a, you know, as a, with a lot of gravitas. I think if you have industry experience that you're bringing to the table that you can be useful and informative with, um, I think that's great. Um, I think just be, be careful about the assumptions you're making. If you're in a different business or organization, they may have different a different business model. They may be optimizing for different priorities. I think you need to understand the business or have the experience behind you to give you the confidence that you can really have an impact. Um, and and I, I make it my business to try and serve as many people as possible during that first 90 days, whether that might be my peers, my boss, um, you know, any senior stakeholders that are around, and then my team, obviously, most importantly, through that first 90 days. So I feel like I've, after 90 days, I feel like I've earned the right to sit in the chair. So prob I, I know it's a useful framing model for me is I don't feel like I've earned the job just because they hired me or because they, you know, in my case, I, as I've moved in Charlie, just because they've given me a different role. I feel like I've kind of got 90 days to sit in the chair, earn the right to sit there, um, and and then hopefully show up at the end of that 90 days with an awful lot more ability to have executive presence, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with a lot of that. Certainly the assumptions piece rang very true for me. So don't make any assumptions, even if something looks the same as something you've seen before. You know, don't assume it is the same because what's going on under the surface could be completely different. Um, and then also, yeah, I mean, you're new in the organization, so you have a fresh set of eyes. So we all get this kind of um, blindness when we're in, in a, a particular organization for a long time. We just sort of see, OK, this is the way things happen. And, you know, a lot of the time that's good because you don't want to think about every process and analyze it. You just want to, the things that work well to to work well. But actually, when you come in, you've got a, a, an opportunity to see the things that aren't working or explore the things that might not be working. And actually, those are the things that you should be looking to change, make them quite few in the first um, period. But those are the ones that, that you know, if you, you can identify the things that are really blocking people and get some of those out of the way, then you're coming in with, you know, good news. Whereas if there's things that are more long-term struggles and with less value then leave those to later but i mean again it's it's a lot of listening as you said so asking questions listening to the answers and even just listening without asking the questions right in the first days because people will be telling you things and picking things up making links and then going going back to to clarify and sometimes yeah as in all things like asking a what's apparently stupid question or very simple question it's they're often the ones that oh we never thought about that you know so i think th those are the kind of things that i would i would recommend in that situation yeah great advice okay so we have 10 minutes left i think we have a couple more questions here so we have one i think there was i saw one in the chat here uh let me see if i can just find it here we go so what extent do executives need to be an active member of strategic conversations that one's from I can't see brendan <coughs> um yeah I, I guess there's a lot of different ways to take that question maybe i'm just trying to kind of parse it first i, I think you know, maybe just assuming it, someone is sitting in the technology seat, I guess. Um, I, I think at some level, I mean, it's your ability to be productive in that conversation. If I can maybe just turn that around like that. You know, it depends on the business. It depends on, on so let me, let me make a couple of assumptions maybe. And, and I'll, cause, because I guess I'll talk at least directly to my experience. So if if you're if you're if you're the CTO and you're running an engineering organization in a in a product business and therefore your teams are delivering the product, um, I, to me personally, I think it's important you're in the you're in the the, the strategic decisions. Um, I, I would also think there's maybe a slightly different way I would think about that in my own head, which is that I need to earn the right to be in those conversations as well. If I'm not um, like, if I'm not, why am I not in those conversations? Is that a legacy historical type of situation? Is, is, is it because I'm not adding any value? 
you know, is it is it for some other, you know, kind of unusual reason? But I, I think I would be I'd be kind of straightforward in having that conversation, you know, which is um, and maybe being a little bit vulnerable there and saying, look, is there some reason why I'm not in those conversations? I think this would be useful and valuable for me. And, and even if it's kind of maybe read only mode at the start and you kind of work your way up to read right. Um, I, I haven't seen too many organizations where the people who are running engineering aren't in those strategic conversations because ultimately, like I said, you're the biggest constraint on the business to some degree. I mean, that's a very negative way to look at it. Like your engineers are producing the product um, um, and you typically know that inside and out. Um, but you know, your ability to deliver on the strategy, you know, the strategy as some high level corp corporate strategy isn't super useful until you understand the path you're gonna navigate down. And that's more important for most small businesses than than kind of the um, you know, Boston Consulting Group version of a strategy that that's kind of the PowerPoint deck, right? You need the organization needs to be able to deliver on it, which is why I think that individual needs to be in the room um, to be able to help shape not just maybe the high level strategy itself, but what way the business is going to attack it. Like if we're going to hit that market, what are the assumptions and constraints around that from an engineering perspective? Because that's probably one of the biggest inputs that needs to be had about maybe how a certain market needs to be um, opened, for example. So, um, I, 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 you know, I think ultimately, yes, but maybe just with some small caveats and some small assumptions that I'm making, I guess, about the roles that I'm more familiar with and the type of businesses that I'm more familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I was reflecting as well as you speaking, and I'm thinking, well, does every executive need to be in every strategic conversation? Um, and I'm thinking, well, probably to a certain extent, yes, because if it is something really kind of high level uh, impact on the company, then it's quite often easy to overlook, especially technology kind of if we, what we're considering kind of impact. So, you know, we're, we're going to the to expand into some new market, right? It's like it would be easy to forget about technology, but there could be all sorts of impacts like, you know, internationalization or different currencies or um, scaling. So, I mean, that one's probably a bit silly because I'm sure technology would, but it would be easy to overlook some of those kinds of uh, impacts. So including, I think, all executives at a high level and then giving um, each function or executive the option to kind of withdraw from the conversation. Okay, you know, it doesn't affect our finances so i don't need to be involved in this specific conversation but i think going ahead with stuff behind people's backs is is you know not certain but highly likely to 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 cause um problems with unidentified issues so that would that, that would be my thought on that one um okay so i think we've we've got five minutes left so time for for one last question here from john uh, how do you handle a board who want to approve every line item of investment but are too busy to consider anything that costs less than 50000 Asking for a friend. Oh, that's not even <laughs> So let's, can we help John's friend? Yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. Um, like, as you get into lots of specifics, so we can just kind of give ourselves a little bit of an out here before we start to answer. There's so much to unpack in specific situations around why is that happening? You know, what's going through the board's head? You know, bo board level approval of, uh, I've never seen that. So it's, it's, I don't know that I can give like advice to say, well, here's, here's the 10 times I've seen that problem and, um, and, and here's how you get out of it. Um, I, I, I think, you know, like anything, I guess your, maybe your ability influence is, is demonstrating either the impact it's having on the business or how it's slowing it down. Um, and, and your ability to need to move the business forward. Kind of coming back down to maybe the board's incentives. The board's incentives are to try and make sure that the shareholders get a return on, on their kind of invested capital. Um, hire or fire the CEO. It's kind of the two two jobs of the board. And, um, you know, you've got to demonstrate the impact of that. And and my assumption is is that if 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 they're doing that, there's probably like you're you're probably not alone. Maybe in having a complaint in that area, you've probably got peers in the senior management team who are feeling exactly the the pinch on that. And um, you know, how do you 
um, show up in a professional way, but with a firm ask, if you like, that maybe some of the dynamic changes. And so, you know, finding out what the board is concerned about, if they want to approve every line item, then there's clearly a concern around maybe how some of the finances are spent. What is that concern? How could you mitigate or alleviate that concern? So what could you do to meet them halfway and build some trust with them, if you like, um, you know, to, to get there? And so maybe more generally, that would probably be my advice. I don't know if you've seen this before, Dan, or not. No, not. I mean, not this specific question. I mean, there's there's the sort of anarchist in me would be saying, well, make sure everything's more each line items more than fifty thousand <laughs> to make it easier for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if they're asking for to approve every item, then you know, what, there's something behind it that's that's not right. So um, if it's impacting your delivery of your function, then as you say, you need to explain that and then try to compromise or overcome whatever it is that's causing them to, to do that. Or maybe, you know, maybe it is about overspend historically or maybe it's about, I don't know, fraudulent um, spend or who knows, there must be something behind it. Um, but I think, as you say, making the case for what it is you're trying to deliver and then maybe you can, I mean, joking aside, group things into bigger initiatives with a, a breakdown of the spend so you can get approval at, at, at a higher level and, and then draw down on it. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe it's just a question of building trust as well. So, okay, well, we need to do it for a while, but this is never going to work long term. How do we overcome it? But, yeah. uh, you know, it's got to, there's got to be some kind of conversation about what's the, the background, uncover what it is, and then create some kind of, uh, as you say, trust or reassure, reassure, reassurance, even reassurance that uh, you are, you know, competent and you're not going to to cause issues for them yeah. in the future. I mean, it, it's pretty standard operating practice that the board approves the operating plan for the year, right? Whatever your fiscal year is, the board typically has to approve that. And so, you know, typically speaking, the way you know most businesses would run that is through budgeting basically and so kind of investment plans where you need to grow and and so they're approving you know a, a packaged unit you know the the workday board is approving some crazy number of zeros plan right and and but you know and so the line items are in there they're just you know they're bundled up into larger investment cases basically so um you know if there's some kind of middle ground there where, where you can kind of figure out basically i mean how, how do we package this, this in a way that you know gives you our operating plan, gives us budgets and constraints that we need to stick to? That is part of the gig as well. If you've got a budget, then then it's your job to be able to stick to that, um, and and that the board can feel confident in approving that, and so they have maybe some predictability on the spend. So maybe if it comes down to that, which is that they feel like maybe the spend isn't predictable, then maybe providing them some predictability suddenly allows you to move to a place where um, you know they feel good about, and it, and it's more of a. a you know, either quarterly or a fiscal year is typically what I've seen. Fiscal year approval, basically for your budget and spend for the year. And and um, you know, if you're if you're in a place where that isn't where that is a, a difficult conversation each and every time, there's probably something that needs to be fixed there. Mm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Phil, for for coming along. Uh, the hour's gone by already, so it's been a great conversation. And thanks everyone for coming and uh, bringing your questions. I uh, hope that we've managed to provide some insights on and answer some of those and I look forward to seeing you again. So from Phil and me, it's goodbye. Take care. Thank you all. Thanks, Dan.